Hello and welcome everyone to the Endcast Showcase. Uh, we're delighted to share with you uh, the progress that we have been making over the last few months to co-develop an early warning system for the Latin America and Caribbean region. Um, and before we dive into the presentations from multiple members of our team, uh, I will just share a little bit of background um, about our research group and the work we've been doing over the years to co-develop early warning system frameworks with many of our uh, partners who are, will also share um, information on this call. So I'm leading the Global Health Resilience Group in the Earth Sciences Department of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, we are an institution of over a thousand uh, researchers and software engineers uh, developing digital solutions to better serve society. Specifically in the Global Health Resilience Group, we are developing ways to integrate climatic and environmental information into decision support tools to better help our partners direct interventions on the ground to improve preparedness and response to climate sensitive infectious disease outbreaks. Uh, we've published a series of um, studies over the years um, looking at different ways that we can incorporate uh, climatic and hydrometeorological indicators into early warning system uh, models to try and predict the risk of outbreaks several months in advance for diseases like dengue and leptospirosis. Uh, we have uh, several articles detailing different methodologies in Brazil, in Ecuador, in Barbados, in the Caribbean, in Vietnam. And you'll also hear a little bit later about some of the work we've been doing to understand the links between floods and leptospirosis in Argentina. Um, several of us in um, our group at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine also published a um, book chapter uh, detailing the different steps uh, leading up to uh, co-developing an early warning system in case you would like to uh, read more about our work in that area. Um, here we can see an example of an early warning system we put together um, several years ago now uh, with our partners in the uh, Brazilian Ministry of Health and the Brazilian Climate and Health Observatory. So the goal of this uh, forecasting system was to create a dengue outlook for the in an entire country ahead of the uh, Brazil Football World Cup in 2014. And uh, this early warning um, was used by the Ministry of Health to help um, design their dengue prevention and control plans and was also adopted by um, the European um, Centre for Disease Control in their travel advisories. And since then, we've been looking at ways that we can innovate our approaches and incorporate different uh, data streams and make use of the latest digital technology, particularly working with the high performance computers at the Barcelona Supercomputing Centre. And we've look at, looking at ways that we can improve the forecast skill of our um, uh, early warnings of disease risk using um, seasonal climate forecasts um, with different lead times. Uh, through a collaboration with our partners in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology and the Ministry of Health and Wellness in Barbados and the Caribbean Public Health Agency, uh, we published a study several years ago identifying um, the delayed and non-linear impacts of different hydrometeorological indicators, in particular um, droughts and exceptionally wet conditions. And we found that uh, following drought events, uh, several months later, we can see an increased risk of dengue. And also this risk is um, exacerbated immediately after exceptionally wet conditions. And this information has helped us be able to shape our methodologies going forward um, and we have been testing this in different places. Here we can see a visualization which tells us the probability of a uh, dengue outbreak uh, from our model where color saturation represents a higher probability. And then the crosses indicate if an outbreak actually was observed. And we use this technique to verify how well our model would have done in Barbados to pick up outbreaks uh, using uh, climatic information. And we found that this uh, using the climatic drivers uh, substantially improved the predictions above using uh, current, current practice methods of tracking the endemic cycle. And this work has been incorporated into the Caribbean Health Climatic Bulletins, which are published on a quarterly basis 
uh, by um, PAHO and partners um, across the Caribbean. So this was an interesting finding that we could um, verify in a small island setting. And then we wanted to understand if this would uh, hold across a large diverse geographical uh, domain such as Brazil. So using um, over uh, 20 years of data, uh, dengue data in Brazil, um, comprising more than 13 million cases, um, we compared this to a drought indicator, in this case, the Palmer Drought Severity Index. And we can see here that droughts in Brazil, particularly in the north and the northeast, are becoming more severe and extreme by the deeper shades of brown in this, in this visualization. And interestingly, in Brazil, we found a very similar pattern that we found in Barbados, where um, the risk of dengue increases around four months after drought events and also um, very shortly after exceptionally wet conditions, and that this effect was exacerbated in urban areas where there were more uh, reports of um, water shortages. So this kind of information helps us tailor our early warnings depending on the geographical setting. And in order to build these kind of frameworks in a sustainable way and make sure that they can actually be applied in practice, we need digital tools to help us first gather <clears throat> the robust, um, a robust data sets to help us bring together all the different pieces of information we need to build these systems. Thanks to the Wellcome Trust, we have a um, digital technology award uh, called Harmonize. In this project, we're working with partners across the Latin America and Caribbean region to <clears throat> harmonize different data types, including uh, gridded climatic products, satellite images, socioeconomic and demographic indicators with disease surveillance data. And we're also integrating locally collected fine scale information from weather sensors and drones to help improve the quality of these larger scale climatic products so that we can provide the best, most detailed information on the ground to build resilience to climate sensitive infectious disease outbreaks. If you'd like to learn more about our Harmonize project, you can visit our website where we have uh, many news articles detailing the different um, pieces of research. And um, so just to um, summarize our ID Extremes project, we are developing an R package to bring together um, the different methodologies we've developed um, to model um, the delayed and nonlinear impacts of climatic variables and their compound effects. Um, and to make a user-friendly tool that can be used by different research communities with their own data. And we're integrating the different R packages which already exist um, in the Earth Sciences Department at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And we're working with partners, um, including InfoDengue, which is a now casting um, dengue system in Brazil, um, with the Red Cross Climate Center and with Médecins Sans Frontières, to make sure that the tools that we develop can be integrated into existing uh, user platforms. Uh, so I'm delighted now um, to pass over to Chloe Fletcher, who has been leading the development of our Endcast product. This is a early warning system platform that we're developing in the framework of our Harmonize and ID Extremes project with many of our partners across the Latin America and the Caribbean region. So um, thank you very much. And I will now pass over to Chloe. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Rachel. Okay, so to introduce myself, my name is Chloe Fletcher. I'm a PhD candidate from the Global Health Resilience Group at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And I'm really grateful to have you all in attendance today to share with you our progress on the NCARS project, uh, which stands for El Nino Driven Disease Forecasting. So NCARS is a decision support tool uh, for disease forecasting, which is at present tailored to the Latin American and Caribbean region. So in this presentation, I will introduce what NCAST is, what it seeks to address, the methodology we've undertaken to develop this tool, as well as some broad level results and opportunities for further collaborations. So to give a brief overview of El Nino Southern Oscillation, it's a natural climate phenomenon that takes place in the tropical Pacific Ocean every two to seven years. It impacts atmospheric uh, circulation patterns that can subsequently affect climatic conditions such as temperature and precipitation across the globe. Now, there are three key phases to ENSO, the first being the El Nino, which is marked by above average sea surface temperatures, the La Nina, which is marked by below average sea surface temperatures, and the neutral phase. 
So in 2023, an El Nino was declared approximately around May to June of that year, and it was pred predicted to be a sizable event. Uh, in actuality, it, it peaked at just under two, um, uh, cent two degrees centigrade above the expected level uh, around uh, November, December and January time. Now, the event was slightly smaller than the extreme event of 2015 to 2016, which had devastating impacts on precipitation and temperature across the globe. So the El Nino has recently started to end, uh, but experts are predicting a quick swing into a La Nina event in this coming season. So based on consensus from the CPC and IRI forecasts, there's currently a greater than 70% chance that there'll be a La Nina event from September 2023 to January 2024, with an estimated peak in November. Now, with this can come some anomalous climatic events, such as cooling, uh, changes in dry and wet conditions. So just to give an overview of how El Nino can impact health, it, El Nino can increase the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, which themselves can have a detrimental effect on human health. For example, through increased food insecurity, displacement, and the increased prevalence of vector-borne and waterborne diseases, both of which are the main focus of NCAS. Now, despite this, there are currently a lack of climate integrated tools that can provide early warnings to inform epidemic preparation, particularly in response to extreme climatic events. And this really highlights a clear gap in the climate and health arena, which needs to be addressed. So to give some overview of how outbreaks have taken place across the Latin American Caribbean region recently in 2023, the region experienced the highest number of dengue cases on record with over 4.5 million cases reported. Now, this number is likely to be much higher if we include asymptomatic cases as well. Now, despite this uh, record-breaking year, the peak has already been exceeded in 2024, with cases over double the amount that they were uh, previously, with 10.8 million uh, cases reported by Epidemiological Week 29. And this suggests that dengue may be an escalating concern in the region as well as other endemic climate sensitive diseases such as malaria and leptospirosis, which are all likely to be exacerbated by climate variability and change. Now to give a more of an overview of what the NCAS project is, we wanted to address the need for more climate integrated decision support tools by developing an early warning framework for infectious disease outbreaks that could respond to emerging El Nino and La Nina events. So within our framework, we're producing probabilistic forecasts for outbreaks of a range of different diseases across the Latin American and Caribbean region, particularly in areas which are sensitive to El Nino events. And over the course of the 2023 to 2024 El Nino event, we've developed, we've produced a monthly forecasts with a one to six month outlook for a range of different diseases across these study sites with an overarching aim to develop a simple and reproducible disease prediction framework that could be rapidly deployed in response to a future El Nino or La Nina, or as part of routine maintenance. Uh, this could also be deployed to any location or climate sensitive disease not currently constrained within this initial prototype. Uh, in, in this initial prototype, we have focused on two vector-borne diseases, dengue and malaria, and one waterborne zoonosis, uh, leptospirosis. And this is covering uh, six different case, six different countries within our, this prototype, um, uh, particularly focusing on regions that are sensitive to the seasonal climatic anomalies during El Nino events, and where we also have established collaborations to support the rapid uh, prototyping phase. And just to understand what the relationship is between El Nino and temperature patterns, here are uh, some images I've taken from the KNMI Climate Explorer, which looks at the correlation between the Nino 3.4 index uh, and the uh, temperature globally. If we focus on the Latin American and Caribbean region, we can see that there are parts of uh, particularly the west and south of uh, uh, west and north of South America, parts of Central America and the Caribbean, which experience extreme heat. Uh, during the El Nino phase. Similarly, uh, for this graphic, which looks at precipitation, where blue marks increased dryness and red marks increased precipitation, we can see different uh, patterns across uh, the region where some areas are experiencing drought conditions and others are experiencing extreme rainfall. 
So in terms of the NCAST framework, what are we actually trying to achieve and what does it look like? Um, here we have seven different steps that form part of our framework, and I'll go through each of those one by one briefly, uh, starting with data harmonization. So in order to inform our models, we need to have a good data that is aggregated to a relevant spatiotemporal unit. So in order to do that, we've been harmonizing spatial, epidemiological, climatic, and population data into a single data set that is aggregated perhaps to per district per month or per canton per month, depending on each uh, particular study site. And the climate variables that we are looking at, we're including a range of different uh, temperature, precipitation, and Nino-based indices at different monthly lags. So the lags allow us to look at delayed associations between uh, particular climate variables and disease cases. And all of the data here are available from freely accessible global climate products, which allow us to have a simple and reproducible framework. And now once we've harmonized the data, we need to visualize it. This helps us better understand uh, any potential uh, anomalies or patterns we may see and expect to help us interpret our results better. For example, here's a time series uh, from top to bottom, looking at the monthly disease cases, followed by the Nino 3.4 index, uh, precipitation and the mean temperature. We can see if we zoom in on some of the peaks across this time series in the dengue cases, we may be able to spot uh, equivalent increases in uh, the Nino 3.4 index, a sharp decline and then rise in the precipitation and increased temperature. Now, just looking at this, we can't necessarily create a model that uh, says those things, but it may help us with the interpretation once we have got a model to hand. And then in terms of the model fitting phase, our approach is to fit thousands of different combinations of uh, models with one precipitation variable, one temperature variable, and one Nino variable, uh, and be able to uh, analyze all of them and see which ones are most appropriate. Uh, for our model formulation, we're fitting our models within a Bayesian framework using the integrated nested Laplace approximation. I won't get too technical about this, but to understand that we're interested in obtaining uh, the disease incidence rates, so this forms our response variable. And uh, in order to look at statistical relationships, we use a range of different covariates that I mentioned earlier with temperature, precipitation, and Nino. Uh, and then we also include some additional random effects so these are additional terms in the model that account for seasonal, interannual, and spatial variation that's not captured by the climate covariates alone. Now, once we've fit these thousands of different models, we undertake a, a comprehensive model selection process, comparing different uh, model evaluation metrics and undertaking exploratory analysis to help us uh, narrow down to a small number of potential models. These models then get some refinements to see if we can add in any additional information to help the uh, performance. And then once we have a maximum of 10 models, we undergo model verification. So this helps us identify the best uh, model for prediction um, by performing a cross-validation process where we remove one year out of the data at a time and see how well the model fills in those missing disease cases. So trying to understand if we were to use this in a real world forecasting scenario, how well it might perform. So to be clear, in a Bayesian model, uh, we make thousands of different predictions for the number of disease cases. Therefore, predictions are formed as a distribution instead of a single value. And that means that our outputs can be represented as a mean value, as a range of values from the minimum to the maximum. We could also take into account the credible interval Typically, we use the 95% credible interval, so in this distribution here, where 95% of the cases are. Or we could even look at probabilistic outputs, such as the probability of an outbreak taking place. So to calculate this outbreak probability, we need to have a minimum threshold, uh, so the minimum number of cases which determines that an outbreak has taken place. This threshold could be uh, a set number of cases per 100,000 people. Or alternatively, we could use uh, the 75th percentile of cases in a given month and location. So if I were interested in a particular district, uh, 
of what the 75th percentile epidemic threshold would be. I would look at all the historic uh, cases for that particular month and district and find out uh, where in that distribution the 75th percentile is. And then any number of cases that exceeds that would be deemed an outbreak. So in the NCAST prototype, we are using this 75th percentile. However, the tool is fully flexible that it can accommodate different thresholds in different countries, depending on local user needs. Uh, in terms of the model verification, we're looking at a range of different metrics to understand how well the model may be able to predict in a real world forecasting scenario. So in figure A, we're looking at uh, the orange solid line is the mean number of cases from our distribution with the orange shading, the 95% credible interval, and then comparing that to the observed cases with the black line. So we can see in this image that the peaks are fairly well captured by this. Um, so we may be able to believe this could be a reasonable model. Also in figure B, we can further explore how well the model performed by comparing the outbreak probability level. Um, so we can look at the range of outbreaks, which are uh, here translated into low, medium, high, and very high risk by color, and compare with whether an observed outbreak took place that month uh, with the X. Ideally, you'd want to see where there is green, there are no Xs, and any other color where there is an X marked. No system is perfect, but this looks like a fairly reasonable model here. And then in figure C, uh, this one's slightly technical, so uh, feel free to gloss over. Um, but the final plot shows the receiver operating curve, uh, characteristic curve for our final prediction model in orange compared to a current practice model, which is a seasonal only model in blue. And what this curve can tell us uh, is it can statistically determine what the minimum outbreak probability should be, which distinguishes uh, no outbreak from an outbreak or alternatively low risk to medium risk. Uh, it does this by uh, maximizing the true positive rates of our model, so how many times it's able to predict an outbreak when there is an outbreak, and minimizing the false positive rate. Um, and that's essentially what we're doing here. Uh, we could also, uh, decision makers are also welcome to recommend different outbreak probabilities depending on their comfort level or needs. For example, if you want to be more confident that an outbreak is going to occur, we can increase that uh, trigger threshold, so increase from 30% to a higher value. Or if we want to detect outbreaks sooner and accept there may be more false positives, we can decrease that trigger threshold. So once we've verified the models, we now have a final best model that we can use to produce monthly forecasts. Uh, so this forms the operational part of the NCAS framework. And in order to produce forecasts, we need to incorporate climate forecasts. So uh, as you can see at the top, climate data and predictions can be found at a range of different scales. In NCAS, we use observations and reanalysis data to inform our statistical relationships that I mentioned previously, and we use seasonal forecasts to make our predictions. So the seasonal forecasts that we're using are from the ECMWF, which has 51 different ensemble members. So they employ 51 different uh, climate models. It is worth pointing out that climate forecasts are subject to biases and are not always available at the desired spatial resolution. For example, on the bottom two panels on the left, we can see is a raw and coarse resolution seasonal forecast for minimum temperature across uh, the parts of the Pacific and leading on to the Pacific coast of uh, um, South and Central America. And on the right hand side, we can see uh, the aggregate, spatially aggregated and calibrated values on the right hand side. And we do this by using statistical downscaling techniques to add finer resolution information uh, to our forecasts. Now, in order to do this calibration uh, process, we need uh, information to form statistical relationships using past forecasts and past observations or reanalysis. So for example, if we wanted a forecast issued for October 2023, we would compare previous forecasts from every October we have available uh, against uh, observations from the same time period. And we can infer statistical relationships between those two data sets and then assume those statistical relationships hold to calibrate the October forecast in 2023. So moving on to how we actually produce the forecast, uh, as I mentioned before, in a probabilistic model, we look at a range of possible values instead of a single value. So in order to produce the range of predicted values, we quantify multiple sources of uncertainty 
to reflect variability in the underlying data and model parameters. Uh, the first source of uncertainty is in the data itself. So in the climate forecast that I've just mentioned, uh, what we do here is we incorporate uncertainty by considering a range of different climate models, and therefore we take all 51 ensemble members into our final forecast. And then the second source of uncertainty is in our parameterization of the model itself. Now, each of the different parameters in the model have its own uh, distribution and set of uncertainty associated with those. So we combat that by taking a thousand different possible parameterizations of the relationship between the disease cases and all of our variables in our model. And when we combine these two sources of uncertainty, we get 51,000 combinations of parameters and climate variables to generate our disease predictions. And this allows us to calculate the outbreak probability. So in this case, we would look at how many or what proportion of our 51,000 samples exceeded our epidemic threshold, and then that would equal the outbreak probability that comes out of our model. And then once we have these predictions, they need to be communicated and visualized. For example, uh, here's an example of how this has been translated at the Canton level in Ecuador, where we have a different outbreak risk level per Canton. Now this outbreak risk level doesn't mean how explosive the uh, epidemic is assumed to be, it is more how confident the model is that an outbreak is going to take place, where a low risk is no outbreak, and then uh, medium high and very high is just increasing confidence of an outbreak. So these levels have been adapted by the World Meteorological Organization risk levels and should translate into specific actions for epidemic preparation according to the level of risk. And these should be set by health agencies who have an explicit mandate to do so. Uh, and so we uh, associate with these risk levels different uh, outbreak probabilities, which, as I mentioned, can be informed statistically or by uh, uh, conversations with local decision makers. Uh, here's an example. If we set that probability, outbreak probability threshold to 30 percent, anything below 30 percent uh, outbreak probability will be deemed a low risk, which means uh, to continue out routine action. Maybe we'd associate 30 to 50 percent as a medium risk where is a, a, a slight um, estimation that the model uh, thinks that there will be an outbreak, 50 to 70% more confident and 70% uh, high confidence there'll be an outbreak and to take action. This is just an example. Each case study will have a slightly different configuration of the outbreak probabilities. So I mentioned before that we're looking at forecasting from one to six months in advance. And I just wanted to highlight this on the slide with our forecasting scheme. So if we were to issue a forecast as of January, we would be issuing six separate forecasts from February through to July. And depending on our model configuration, we have an example there at the bottom, and the lagged associations we have with climate variables, we may be able to make use of observed data and forecast data. Now, observations are obviously more ideal because they're what actually happened, uh, whereas forecasts can have their own associated uncertainty with them. So if we look, for example, three months ahead here in April, we can make use of observed Nino, but then we must use uh, forecasted temperature and precipitation in this configuration. However, if we were to make an issue in February, moving closer to April, now we're two months ahead, we can update our forecast with observations for temperature, as well as a new forecast for precipitation, which again should have slightly more accuracy considering we're near the target. And then by month three, we can make pure use of observations one month in advance. So just to give a, an overview of the model formulations that we currently have, I present some of the dengue case studies for Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, where we're showing here the lagged association between each variable with dengue cases. We can see lots of similarities across the countries. For example, three of them employ the three month average minimum temperature, in uh, Brazil, Colombia, and Peru. Also three use um, the three month average precipitation, see Brazil, Ecuador, and Peru. Uh, in terms of differences, we notice that Ecuador and Peru use the Nino one plus two index, whereas the others use the Oceanic Nino index based in Nino uh, 3.4 region. Now this is intuitive because the Nino one plus two region includes the coastal areas of both Peru and Ecuador, and therefore this region is likely to be more closely associated with climatic anomalies, which may impact dengue risk. 
Additionally, the lag times here are slightly shorter, which is likely due to the close proximity and perhaps uh, faster climate and health impacts. Uh, it seems that oceanic Nino indices may have a longer lead time uh, and potentially may reflect a more delayed impact on dengue risk in Colombia and Brazil. But for now, this is just speculative. And to share with you an overview of some dengue predictions that were made during the 2023 to 2024 El Nino event. So as we know, the El Nino peaked in the Nino 3.4 region between November 2023 and January 2024. Therefore, we decided to show the forecast issued in November 2023 for three months in advance, which means it's a, this is the forecast for February 2024 uh, dengue at different uh, spatial aggregations in each country. So we can see almost all of Colombia was considered to be at high or very high risk of dengue, where the 75th percentile of cases in February uh, were predicted to be highly exceeded. Uh, in Peru, we can see the primarily increased cases in the northern coast, as well as some parts of the central and southern coast and Selva regions were at high risk of outbreaks or very high risk. And in Ecuador, we mostly see largely coastal and slightly more inland were showing medium high or very high risk of outbreaks. Now, it's not possible to demonstrate all the forecasts simultaneously, but hopefully this gives you an idea of what types of early warnings can be made using these prediction models. And um, please note that some further work is needed to validate how successful these forecasts are uh, were, and we will be doing that shortly. In terms of the timescales and frequencies of actions with the NCAR framework, the first six steps of our framework should ideally be repeated every one to two years at least, uh, with the final part of the framework on a monthly operational basis. Initially, we plan to host the forecast during just the recent El Nino, but we will likely keep producing these forecasts into the future, uh, perhaps welcoming future collaborations. Uh, in order to visualize these forecasts, we've co-developed an online platform with decision makers and researchers across the region, which has a range of interactive features to scrutinize the disease predictions, as well as explore historic data. Uh, it's important to note that each country's data is completely secure and only available with uh, special permissions, so each part of the website is uh, restricted. Uh, Daniela Lewison will give a live demo of the platform shortly, and we would be delighted to have your feedback on elements you would find useful uh, or would change. Additionally, we've produced a monthly forecast bulletin, which will be available in the web platform to download and can be circulated as a PDF. Here is an example of part of the Peru bulletin, although you'll hear more from Bruno Carvalho shortly about the bulletin that's under development for dengue in uh, Brazil. Lastly, I just wanted to share with you some plans for uh, further development of the tool, as well as opportunities for future collaborations if you're interested in getting involved. Uh, we will be finalizing our malaria case studies in Brazil, Colombia and Peru, uh, mostly focusing in the Amazon regions. Uh, we'll be evaluating uh, all of the disease risk forecasts that we produced over the previous El Nino against observed cases, so we'd need to be able to access 2023 to 2024 cases. We would love to expand our case studies beyond the Latin American and Caribbean region. NCAST is not unique to this region and can be adopted in places elsewhere. And we'd be really interested in potential collaborations, particularly during the upcoming uh, forecasted La Nina. Uh, we welcome uh, working with national ministries of health to include real-time case data, which will substantially improve our forecast accuracy, as well as looking to adopt additional indicators into the platform. And lastly, uh, we would love to collaborate with local, national and regional health agencies to support the development of this product into early warning systems that can align with local uh, needs. I just wanted to say a special thank you to all of the team. It's been a huge multi-institutional uh, collaboration for providing data analysis expertise and of course your precious time. I'm very grateful as well as to our funder, uh, the Wellcome Trust, through the Harmonize and ID Extremes project. Uh, thank you very much for your time and listening to this presentation. I'll now hand over to Daniela, and we'll take some questions after that session. Thank you so much, Chloe. It, it'd be wonderful if uh, people could include their um, any questions in the Q&A box. I can see we already have some uh, questions and discussions going on there. 
hopefully we can already begin to collaborate with um, Uruguay after your call for collaboration, Chloe. And I'm delighted to now pass over to Daniela Lusen, who is the Global Health Resilience Data Scientist, who will give a demonstration of the NCAST app. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so, and thank you for the introduction. I will now show you the web app that we have developed to communicate all the results that we have produced during NCAST. Uh, before jumping into the web app, I want to uh, focus that this is a co-creation process and it's still in the research phase. So although it all is almost fully functional, we do not have this operationalized yet. And it's still, if you have any feedback, it's very welcome. So let's jump right in. So this is the landing page with the introductory message, which at the moment is only available in English, but in the future, we also want to translate it to Spanish and to Portuguese. The other thing that you can see on the landing page is this map where you can see all our current project countries. So the landing page and also all the additional, additional information uh, about the project and about our team will be publicly available. However, the rest of the page, so all the forecast the, and the data will be secured by a password as Claire already mentioned. So let's jump, uh, for example, to Colombia. So as soon as you select one country, you have to enter your password and your username. And all these passwords are country specific. So Colombia will receive only a password that's valid for Colombia and so on. Once we are authenticated, you will see that on the top, we have three new tabs with forecast, model verification, and historical data. Um, I'm gonna go through all three of them and we're gonna start in the forecast. So the most important thing in a forecast is of course this map, which is interactive. So you can hover over each region and see the outbreak probability. Uh, as I said before, you can see the outbreak probability on the map. So for example, in Casanare, it's now 46%. And we've also color coded it into the ranges that Chloe told you earlier from low to very high. And as Van Chloe said earlier, you can see here the different categories and all of these can be adjusted to every single country. And we have a lot of options. So for all the countries that have multiple diseases, you can select which disease you want to visualize. Then we also have the threshold. So um, like Chloe mentioned before, we use a percentile. So we use uh, the historic cases and then see where is the 75th percentile, but also where's the 95th percentile in, in case you want to see. So the 95th percentile will be higher, so the risk will be lower. So you can see that the map will turn much more green. Then, because we forecast six months into the future, you can select all the target months. So now we can see July 24 up to December 2024. Let's visualize that. And also in case anyone is colorblind, we have colorblind friendly palettes and also a gray scale palette. And because we have been working on this for a few months, we already have produced lots of forecasts. So by default, you always see the news forecast, but if you're interested in seeing historical forecasts, you can also see the forecast that, for example, we produced in February of this year for March to August. Okay, so this is for the whole country. If you're interested in seeing one specific region, you can just click on it and you will see that you will switch tabs from national to local. Now you can see that here we still have the same options like threshold, color palette, forecast period, but we have a new option. So we have three different plots that describe the forecast within each area. Here they are organized from the more simple to the bit more complicated ones. So in the bar plot, for example, the one that you can see here, on the x-axis, you can see all the six forecast months that we're forecasting at the moment, so from July till December of this year. And on the y-axis, you can see the probability of an outbreak. So the higher the bar, the higher the probability of an outbreak. And then the next plot type is the plot in whiskers. Because as Chloe mentioned, we have many different ways of visualizing our predictions. So in this case, we visualize them as a range. So this blue 
line that you can see here, that's the credible interval. So 95% of our predictions fall within this range of, in this case, from almost 300 cases to 10,000 cases. The dot is the mean. And the red lines that you can observe here are the thresholds. So what you ideally want, will want is that the blue line is completely below the threshold to have no risk. And again, here it's very nice that you can select a different threshold and you can see how it changes in this map. So because the 95th percentile is a higher absolute value of the threshold, you can see how they all rise up. And finally, the last plot that I'm going to show to you is the probability density function, which you've already seen in closed presentation earlier. So here you can see on the x-axis the number of predicted cases, and then on the y-axis you can see how they're distributed. Um, and now the threshold is this red line, but this time is, it's vertical. And again, as you can see, it's very visualized. It, if you change it, you can see. Um, and here, what's important is that these blue, this blue area is the number of cases that is above the threshold, whereas the yellow ones is the number of cases below the threshold. Okay, that's so far for forecast. And now I'm gonna move over to the model verification. Um, as Chloe mentioned before, the model verification is basically where we compare our model to the observations of the past. So you can see for each country, you have a rock curve where you can see how our model works in red versus a current practice. So the only seasonal model in green. And again, if you're interested in knowing how well exactly the model works for one specific area, you can go down here, select whatever area you're interested in. I'm gonna stay in Akiyoka. And you can see a line in black, which are the observed cases from 2007 till 2023. And the black line, you can see how our model performs. And you can see most of the peaks, uh, it at least noticed that there was a peak, which is already quite nice. Whereas as in a seasonal only model, which would be this, you can see that it does not notice the peaks as well. And another way of verifying the model is through a heat map. And I'm going to switch back to the prediction model. So now, as Chloe explained before, here you can see on the x-axis all the months from January to December, on the y-axis all the years from 2007 to 2022. And you can see what our model predicted the risk level would be from low to very high. And the axis are where an outbreak actually occurred. So we really want to have that all the red areas have an x on top which in this case, most of them have. In a current practice model, you can see that there's not a good correlation between them. And finally, I'm going to go to the historical data. Um, so you can do exactly what Chloe and our, all, all of our team was doing at the beginning of NCAS to see if there are any correlations or yes, just get to know the data. So for example, we can see the Dende cases in Antioquia. And if you want, you can compare different variables. So for example, let's take a mean temperature. So you can see, and again, all of these plots are very interactive. So for example, if you want to see this peak, you can just zoom in and the plot will automatically zoom in for both. Also, if you're interested, you can compare different spatial regions. So for example, Antioquia and Huila, and you can see any differences here. Then in the historical data, we also have maps. So for example, I think the peak, the Dengue peak was in June 2010, if I remember correctly. So here we can see a map of Colombia, have of the dengue cases within Colombia uh, uh, during that month. And also, for example, if you're interested to see the precipitation, you can just change the variable and see the distribution of precipitation in Colombia during this month. And then to the last two plots, this is an interannual plot where you can see on the x-axis the months from 
January to December. Uh, on the y-axis, you can see the precipitation, and every single line is one different year. So this is very nice to see if there's any seasonality. So you can see that the pre precipitation is low at the beginning of the year, higher during May to October. Also, if you're interested in a specific month, you can just double click and see that specific year. And finally, the heat map is very similar. So then I'm gonna take something where it's more visual. So we have the months from January to December on the x-axis, all the years on the y-axis, and you can see exactly where it was higher. So here you can clearly see that there was a peak in 2010 and in during watch season. Also again in 2016, you can see in what season there was an outbreak. So this is the app that we have until now. Any feedback is very welcome. And in the future, I look forward to sharing passwords and usernames with you so you can all access it. Thank you very much, Daniela. That was a fantastic demonstration. Uh, we now have some time for uh, question and answer. So I can see that we've had quite an active uh, Q&A box. So thank you all for including your questions there. Do feel free to um, ask, you know, add questions to the box. You can also um, indicate if you'd like to speak and we could make you a co-host. Uh, so while people think about their questions for uh, Chloe, Daniela, or any of the other speakers, um, I can just go through some of the questions we've already had. Um, so we have here in the open questions um, from Leo um, asking if there's a rationale uh, on the reason why we didn't include other climatic indicators like the PDO or the AMO. Um, so I may pass that question to Chloe. Yes, absolutely. Um, we've had conversations, including with our uh, through our collaboration in the Caribbean, to potentially look to include uh, Atlantic Ocean indices or potentially other climate phenomenon that are taking place globally. Uh, we wanted in this first prototype to have more of a consistent methodology that was most likely to be applicable to the region, which is why we focused on uh, El Nino, uh, sorry, yeah, El Nino, um, Southern Oscillation and Pacific uh, indicators. Uh, we, in a future past, would be interested in looking at perhaps interactions between these different climate phenomena, uh, maybe including alternative ones for particular case studies. So I, I would call that an active research line uh, that we'd like to pursue in the future. Thanks, Chloe. Um, we've also discussed with um, some of our partners in the Caribbean um, the, import, the, the importance of um, signals from the Atlantic in determining the climate there. And in our projects in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. we're also exploring the um, Indian Ocean di Dipole, which in some cases can also uh, act as a good predictor as well as the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So thanks for that. Um, so we have um, from uh, Cristóvão Barcelos um, from the Brazilian Climate Health Observatory, um, during the peak of El Nino, so uh, summer 24, uh, there was a massive rainfall and flood in southern Brazil, also affecting north of Argentina and Uruguay. How well can climate models predict those extreme weather events? I don't know if anyone uh, would like to take that. I can also welcome um, answers from our the speakers yet to come. <laughs> uh, or Gabriela, maybe actually a good person to answer this one. Um, <clears throat> anyone like to have a stab? Uh, probably in a more general, not super climate technical, so not a climate uh, person who does forecasts. Uh, but from my understanding, uh, precipitation forecasts are fairly skilled uh, for the first month or two, and the skill can drop off, particularly for seasonal climate forecasts, a little bit beyond. So we would hope that we could make, depending on the lag of association we see in the leptosporosis model, for example, which would be highly related to uh, rainfall in southern Brazil, I'll let Martin talk on that a bit later. Uh, perhaps we would be able to uh, be able to measure, ideally, maybe four month, uh, three to four months in advance with reasonable skill, depending on uh, that lagged association. 
Uh, in terms of the forecasts themselves, I, I couldn't possibly comment uh, with exactness. Great. Um, we have a, a question here from Claudia Podesso, and there's also a related one from uh, Seth. Um, will we be able to download the forecast and alert levels uh, through the Shiny? Um, so as the project progresses, um, users in the specific countries will have um, password protected access to this. So in that case, uh, the specific users with access would be able to um, download this information in the bulletins. And I'll just um, move to Seth's question. I think I will pass this one over to Daniela, um, which was, if I can find it, it was asking about if the data was available behind the app and programmatically, if you could download the data with an API. Um, we have thought about it for the moment. It's not implemented yet, but we have played around with doing an API for the Shiny apps. So if that is something that people want, we can definitely implement that because the data would be available. It's only a matter of implementing an API. Thank you so much. Okay, wonderful. Oh, yeah, so we have um, a question here from um, Sushila from Mauritius. Thank you so much for joining. Um, and if there's any chance of collaboration, um, we'd absolutely welcome, as Chloe mentioned in her talk, um, collaborations from other parts of the globe. Um, we have very sort of strong networks in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and through some of our other projects, we're also developing partnerships in um, Africa, um, Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands, and, and many other parts. And we're very welcome. Um, we'd very much look forward to trying to apply this in other settings. Uh, we're hoping to also work with our partners in Mozambique, who are very interested in how mm -hmm. La Nina, um, which is related to flooding in their region, may impact um, the risk of um, outbreaks of ma malaria and other climate sensitive diseases there. So please do feel, to reach, feel free to reach out to us and we could uh, look at ways to collaborate. I'm just going to have a quick look at the answered um, questions because I know some interesting things came up there. Um, so Carlos um, Barbosa from Uruguay um, is um, interested in collaborating, which would be wonderful. And also um, had a question about um, if we could include um, different environmental indicators like refuge collection and how that could help with the forecast. So I think I'll pass that to Chloe. Yeah, we would absolutely welcome additional uh, sources of data to be able to incorporate into these models, particularly if the data source has fairly high quality and longevity, so we can be able to infer statistical relationships over a larger, a longer period of time. Uh, currently, we're just using these three variables in this initial prototype. We're aware that just these three variables on their own are not going to fully explain every single outbreak of every single disease. Um, and if there are particular uh, sources of data that in your context, you would be interested in incorporating uh, and have access to data, we would, we would love to incorporate it. The model we have available is very flexible and could handle uh, additional sources of data within. Thanks so much. And we have a question from Alvaro um, Silva about, um, if uh, we plan to assess the added value of considering additional forecast outputs from other uh, global centers, and Mauricio has um, kindly included an answer here um, that we are um, looking to generate ensemble forecasts from uh, different products, including local products. Um, and we do have experience working with our partners in the Caribbean, where we are using the forecast directly from the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. Um, which we believe is um, probably the preferred route to be able to incorporate local products, um, which are just tailored for the region. So that's certainly a possibility. Um, in this particular prototype, we've been using the forecast from the ECMWF uh, forecasting system, but we could incorporate forecasts from different systems for sure. Uh, then we have uh, <clears throat> a question here from uh, Novil. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, so how transferable are the methods to other regions of the world, um, for example, in Southeast Asia region that I come from, um, mm -hmm. which has a high ENSO related infectious disease cases? Um, and did you observe that predicting an outbreak would lead to outbreak control in higher areas? 
often many other factors in addition to knowing in advance of outbreaks hamper their control. Uh, we will be sharing the recording as well. Um, so I'll just uh, pass over to Chloe to add some couple of observations um, about the applicability of the system to other places and perhaps touch on our uh, forecasting efforts in Southeast Asia. Yes, absolutely. So um, we uh, this framework is super flexible. It could be adapted to a, a different context, whether that's in uh, parts of tropical Asia or Africa. Um, the model is the the framework is really a, for endemic disease, so it would not necessarily be applicable in areas where there is a new introduction of disease, such as looking in Europe and and so on. Um, so in this context, depending on uh, the country, I'm sorry, I don't know if that was stated there, I might have missed that. Um, hopefully we would be able to apply that there, no problem. Uh, something to bear in mind is the, uh, as you mentioned, the fact that uh, actions are taken in order to prevent diseases before they occur. Um, this is one of the challenges with this forecasting system, where if it were to be implemented and uh, actions were taken to reduce that uh, uh, outbreak, and then it would I it would say the model is technically wrong because no outbreak uh, took place when there was an outbreak, um, but that may be because the model generated forecasts and action was taken, and even historically actions have been taken uh, in the past where those are not specifically incorporated into the model. Ideally, in a future past, I would like to somehow incorporate interventions that have taken place historically. A challenge there is being able to access data that can clearly define that and ways that we can clearly incorporate that into the model. So as Rachel mentioned, we're currently involved in several projects across uh, South and Southeast Asia, including dengue and malaria forecasting in Bangladesh, um, Sri Lanka, uh, Malaysia, and Vietnam. Uh, each of these are incorporating an additional range of variables, uh, kind of off the back of this framework, um, but using uh, slightly adapted methods. And, and much more data than just the three variables we have now. Um, so we would be interested in also adapting these methodologies for other case studies. Thank you so much, Chloe. So we have a few more questions coming through, but in the interest of time, we will continue with the showcase as some of the questions I think will be um, answered as we move through, particularly regarding differences to do with spatial scale. Um, so I will now introduce um, Dr. Bruno Carvalho, uh, who will share with us um, a bulletin that's been tailored for the Brazilian context. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you so much, Rachel. Let me share my screen. Um... Eu vou, eu vou apresentar em português, uh, sendo representante brasileiro da equipe. É, e vou falar um pouquinho sobre... I will present in Portuguese, as I am the Brazilian representative of the team, and I will speak about this system for Brazil. This model was particularly developed for dengue, and it is important to provide some background information on the bulletin that we are producing for cases like this. So, for the models in Brazil, we are currently calibrating spatial temporal models for the entire country. We have 450 health regions in the country. And considering this number of territorial units, of course, it's a challenge to be able to condense this information in data and graphs that are simple but comprehensive at the same time. So what we've done is we've grouped these results based on the five largest regions in the countries and the different states. The bulletins are automatically generated based on a number of provisions of some forecasts, I should say, and they are published in Portuguese and in English. Let me very quickly show them to you so we can see what the bulletin looks like. Here is the English version and the Portuguese version on screen. And let me very quickly 
go through the Portuguese bulletin. What we want out of this bulletin is for it to be a document that you can download from our web platform. And each forecast will have a new bulletin. And the bulletin that you can currently see on screen shows June data, although this is just preliminary data, it's not the final June data, as we are still working on developing the model. We are fine-tuning the model for Brazil. At the beginning, we have an introductory text on the project and how the process is unfolding in the country. We use a similar structure for the rest of the countries, of course, tailored to each country's needs. There is a brief description of the model as to what happens with the outbreaks, as Chloe mentioned, based on the different risk scholars, as Chloe said, for Brazil in particular, we are showing the forecasted rest levels for the five big regions in the country. So instead of showing the 450 health regions in Brazil, which would make it more complex in how we view the data, we're grouping data in these graphs that you can see on screen. Each bar is represented regions. by the other months. And here we have the different this colors, the which month. are the uh, outbreak risk and, and the, the percentage of the regional health areas. For example, in the north re northern region, we have this percentage with few regions with very high risk of outbreak. And uh, I believe that with this visualization, this is like a photograph of the country in the different regions and how this risk varies over time in the different regions. So what we have next is a description, quite a long description, in fact, in greater detail of the risk and also uh, still in regions. So we start with a map for the next three months in this north region. And this is similar to the map we saw before, but now we can see the different health regions. And after that, we have a text which emphasizes which are the states which have uh, very high risk of a dengue outbreak. So here we have the different states, and then we have the more detailed information for each of the health regions in this region of Brazil and for the next month. So the colors show the risk of an outbreak, and the number on top is the probability of this outbreak occurring for the next six months. So, yes, this is a very long table, and we decided not to show it uh, completely in the web platform, uh, as it's a more interactive platform but the user can download this information as a more complete report to see the forecasts for the region of their interest. And this is the general overview of the bulletin. It follows the same format for each of the regions of Brazil. And I think I'm going to stop here because I really just wanted to show you the structure of the bulletin, and obviously we would thank any kind of feedback or comment so that we can improve this uh, bulletin and the way we inform the results to you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, I will now pass over to Dr. Mauricio Santos Vega and Juan Daniel to uh, share insights from the Columbia case study. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi everyone, hola a todos, muchas gracias por venir. Eh, Juan Daniel, puedes presentar, puedes poner las diapositivas. Thank you everyone for coming. Juan Daniel, can you please display your slides? Hoy vamos a mostrarle muy brevemente lo que... Let me very quickly... Lo que hemos, lo que hemos o los resultados que hemos obtenido... Show you the results <clears throat> from the Colombia models. Give me one second. Okay, there you go. So, um, soy Mauricio Santos, a eh, professor de la Universidad I'm de Mauricio los Andes. Mauricio Santos, I am the professor at the Los Andes el, University el, and the director el, el de of the Mathematical Biology eh, and Computational el, el, at the Los Andes el, University. <clears throat> We wanted to show you the local context, as Chloe said. Many of the results in Colombia are expressed at departmental level, but we can very easily scale them and adapt them to a municipality level. This is something we are looking for to do it together with local stakeholders. As in many cases, it is needed to have more data available to really capture the country's heterogeneity as there's such diversity in Colombia. Juan, you have the floor for the results. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. So what we wanted to share with you today are the results of the NCAS implementation for dengue in Colombia. Let me start explaining what was the model that better captured the statistical relations with the disease observed. We wanted to look at the incidence rate at a regional level. The best model included three month average temperature three months before the months that we wanted to forecast, monthly rainfall, two months before the month under study, and the Oceanic El Nino index five months before the month under study. We included random effects or seasonal and annual effects to be able to capture the seasonality of data and a spatial effect. That is, there is a differential effect between departments and regions for this analysis. These are estimations and validations that we did from the model together with the observations for the different regions. In Colombia, we have six regions. As you can see on screen, it is a climate, cultural, and even political delimitation, and the model is able to capture transmission across the different years and regions. There are some particular times where the models estimate outbreaks that did not happen in the region at the time, but these are the opportunities for improvement. When we do further work, working more closely together with decision makers and local notification methodologies, considering the effects of temperature, temperature had a significant impact in all regions except the Amazonian and center west. We want to continue investigating why it is that in those regions in particular, the effect was not so, or even the biology of the vector and the transmission of the disease led uh, this to, to, to be so. In the Pacific region, the effect is quite strong as in Rinokia and the Atlantic region. In terms of the effect of rainfall or the 
the other regions, the effect is almost null in terms of the range of, of rainfall values. We could associate or we could explain this by saying that it makes sense considering the vectors biology where the conditions really are more dependent on breeding sites for the different breeds. Although we also want to understand how the rainfall patterns might also change those breeding sites availability. And therefore we want to have an increasingly better spatial resolution, smaller within municipalities and departments. With regards to the El Nino Oceanic Index, the El Nino Phenomenon Index was the one that uh, showed a better performance for the model. The index has a positive effect in all regions except the Atlantic region. We want to understand why, if maybe there are other climate conditions in the Atlantic that might be better to describe the effect of climate in dengue transmission. But in the other regions, this particular index is very positive and beneficial against the relationships as it allows us to create an early warning system or a probability outbreak uh, and, and, and estimations. As uh, we saw for the web version of NCAS demonstration, we have a map online showing the outbreak probability. And uh, as Chloe also explained, we are very open and, and the model is very flexible to include other, other indicators that might be useful for decision making. We know that in, in Colombia, rather than the risk of an outbreak, what we were assessing were risk areas based on different methodologies like the endemic channel. This does not conflict with other instruments that we already have in place to estimate the risk of dengue in Colombia. It's just an additional tool that we want to make available to prevent control and, and, and to provide for out, outbreak response. We have a predictive capacity of three months. The success rate is 61%, false positive or false alarms of 23%. That is why. 33%, I'm sorry, which is quite sensitive to the parameters for implementation and what we want to use in decision makers. And the new opportunities that we see for the model in Colombia is being able to uh, include more fine-tuned spatial scales, to include more social and climate variable, to work with local institutions, and to uh, integrate data with um, a, 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 a shorter delay in the notification to help us correct some of the dynamics and find alternatives for the use of the previous uh, period rather than the current year. So this is a big room for improvement for our early warning system and to add new tools and provide for new evidence for informed decision making. We wanted to, well, first thank all Colombian institutions present in the showcase and also say that this is really the baseline of a product that we want to enhance in collaboration with the different institutions to, one, enhance and improve success rates, the prediction scale, and um, be able to enhance and improve the product to make it an instrument that will aid decision making. Thank you, everyone. And Rachel, back to you. Gracias, Mauricio y Juan Daniel. Ahora voy a presentar a Merci Bogor Córdoba del EPSOL en Ecuador. Muchísimas gracias, Merci. 
Muy buenos días a todos. Mucho, un placer Good para morning, mí. everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here with all of you uh, who are in different parts of the America and the planet. I'm also a senior research scientist at the Pacific International Center for Disaster Risk Reduction. I want to do my presentation in Spanish. Y vamos a ver un poco qué es lo que hemos... I will este, be making my presentation uh, in Spanish. I will be talking about what we have been doing with the NCAST process, which we use here with our group, with the Barcelona group, um, and also the case study we will be presenting today specific, specifically applies to 2015 ENSO. Can you see my full screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, first of all, I would like to uh, present the uh, dengue data for 2015 with the data from the Ministry of Public Health. Here you can see that we had many cases. Have a look at the left column. We had up to 76,688 cases. So it was a huge epidemic. With the data we had that year, we tested the model that has already been presented by Chloe and the Colombian and the Colombian colleagues have been uh, perfecting the model. In Ecuador, we have worked with two resolution scales. Uh, the, this is the first one at province level. And here we have uh, 24 provinces. The other is the Canton scale, where we have, uh, as we have 221 cantons. So our objective was to um, see how this uh, selected model works with, with potential benefits. And it, this is very similar to what our Colombian colleagues said. This, the model selected uses seasonal variation, also interannual variation to capture this a seasonal monthly variability and interannual variability. And to do this, it uses a spatial random effect, uh, which we use to determine the difference in the number of cases uh, around the territory. And then the three variables we have already seen. Number one has to do with mean temperature with uh, a lag between zero to two months. Uh, also, month, three month average precipitation, lag zero to two months, and El Nino one plus two region. This is one that is the closest to the continental area in Ecuador and for a one month period. Let, let us now see the results. These are two dengue outbreak risk maps. These results uh, correspond to three months of anticipation. If you compare this to the Ministry of Health data, you will see that uh, the spatial distribution data are consistent. Therefore, the results have shown that for 2015, these three months, months of anticipation yielded very good results uh, uh, compared to year-long data. This is and goes until April 2015 to forecast NGA cases for July 2015. In red, there are four provinces. Um, some are coastal, others are located in the subtropical area of the Andes. And these are areas that are at a high dengue outbreak risk. Let us have a look at the cantons. And here we can see 
uh, a difference in the spatial resolution scale. We have 221 cantons. And here we can see uh, where the areas with the highest risk were. Here we have the cantons, uh, and we can identify some of these uh, areas. San Vicente, Tosawa, and specific populations such as in the coast, such as Arenillas and others. And here we, it's not the whole province that is highlighted. We can actually pinpoint the specific areas that are at a higher risk of having a, a dengue outbreak. Uh, regarding what the model can offer, we can see that the model is highly consistent. When we work at Canton level, there are some benefits. Why? Because there is lower uncertainty, but also when it comes to intervention and what actually can be done regarding collaborating with the Ministry of Public Health, this can provide a lot more information uh, uh, regarding the work with local groups. Well, finally, what we have here are the results of the uh, benefits of the model presented. In red, we can see the, the uh, accuracy rates of the model implemented for three months ahead. And in blue, we can see the uh, seasonal model, which is uh, called the current model. Here we can see the three months ahead and the model as it is provide, all of this provides us with, with better accuracy rates. Have a look at the area under the curve, not 0.85, which is quite good. A true positive rate of not 0.75, a false positive rate of 20%. When we work with the Canton prediction model, when we work with the province prediction model, the rates are a slightly lower, 76%, 68%, false positive rate increases to 31%. Well, uh, final takeaways in this very brief summary of the model application. The results are quite good, they're acceptable. And with these three months in advance, we can do some interesting work because there can be some testing um, actions, there can be plotting, working together with the ministries of public health and the communities in the territories. Uh, spatially, apparently, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference and we still have some difficulties regarding uh, the, the predictive skills of the forecasting method. We need to improve the different types of infrastructure and so that we can uh, present the data to improve the forecasting skills of the model. Therefore, uh, this is a great opportunity. The El Niño indicator gives us information about these three months um, ahead of time. So it's very interesting to work with each canton because this allows us to prepare specific actions to, as Rachel said, we can verify past interventions, we can model uh, past scenarios to see if some specific results can be reflected in model. And also depending on the data quality, we can also include further data for instance, circulating virus rates, the dengue, or other types of information that might be useful to improve the quality of uh, the forecasting skills of the model. Thank you so much for your attention. Muchísimas gracias. Merci. Thank you so much, Mercy. Ahora. Now, I would like to give the floor to 
Paloma Cárgamo, who also works with our colleague Gabriel Carrasco at the Peruvian University of Cayetano Heredia. Thank you so much, Paloma. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you to all of you for your attention. I would like to make my presentation in Spanish. I am part of the Health Innovation Laboratory, part of the uh, Cayetano Heredia Peruvian University. I would like to talk about the results of the forecast validation of the model we selected to predict dengue outbreaks in Peru. This is a province level model and just implemented on the coast and the uh, forest and the jungle in the country. Uh, these are the dengue cases in our country between 2000 and 2023. As you can see, the, we had a huge peak in 2023. Uh, we used data between 2000 and 2022 for the model and the 2023 data are the ones used to validate our results. I would like to show you which are the effects we chose in the model for Peru. We use minimum temperature, average precipitation levels, and El Niño 1 plus 2, surface temperature of the sea, because it has the most connections with uh, meteorological variables in our country. We used a, a monthly variable, one for the um, different types of coasts and another one for the jungle. We also have annual variables and by department, and they help us adjust spatial variation. Non-linear effect of minimum temperature. As you can see here, this is negative with a low range of temperatures that becomes positive at some point. And uh, got a precipitation, there is increased uh, risk in a given range, and then it decreases. This uh, agrees with what Rachel said, and also with what the literature says regarding the effects of meteorological variables on the uh, impact of dengue. For anomalies in surface um, sea temperature, we used this uh, um, month minus three criteria. On the, no on the north coast, we uh, include from Angas to Tagna. So this is considered center and south area. And this is the jungle area in the Amazon. Generally speaking, when we have coastal El Niño events in Peru, uh, most of the meteorological impacts take, take place on the north coast, increased precipitations and increased temperatures. These impacts can also affect the central coast and part of the southern coast as well. Um, usually there's no much impact on the rainforest during El Niño, but there might be uh, anomalies during La Niña. So we have seen in our model when there are anomalies in the SST in the El Niño 1 plus 2 region, we have significant impact, but there's a positive effect on the north coast and negative for the center south coast and for the rainforests. These impacts are different, and this makes sense, especially when we included the 2023 data. Uh, in this case, we notice that the center south coast impact changes, direction changes, and this highlights the variability of the El Niño effects on meteorological variables in a country and the need to use updated data to really reflect what's happening in our country. I would like to show you what happened, how our model did. First, please focus on this chart on the right. 
false positives. Here in green, we can see true positives. This means that the model with the specifications I showed you predicted that there should be an outbreak or a high probability of an outbreak. And that indeed happened in that month, in August, September, October, uh, November, or December of 2023. The true negatives are here in light green. The model said that there was a low outbreak probability, and indeed there was no outbreak. Oh, we didn't get the threshold of cases considered to determine the existence of an outbreak. In light pink, we have the false positives. So the model said uh, uh, an outbreak is probable, but it wasn't. And in red, we have, we, we have the false negatives. These are provinces for which the model did not forecast an outbreak, but there was an outbreak. Here on the right, we can see that most of the pink and red areas are in the rainforest and along the central coast. Uh, in 2023, on the central coast, many of the provinces that had never reported dengue cases reported them for the first time. So, so maybe the, the model had some trouble predicting these specific cases. However, if we were to include real-time uh, cases information, this might improve. And it's harder to predict the effect of El Nino on the rainforest. The model found it more difficult to forecast the cases here. If we included information about the cases in each year in real time, I'm sure we can improve these predictions. However, you can see that the percentage is higher than 60% for August, September, October, November, December. This is the accuracy rate of true negatives and true uh, positives are quite high. So this means that the predictions are quite reliable. So this model is good or relatively good when it comes to predicting an outbreak. This doesn't mean that the information provided by the model regarding the number of cases is necessarily accurate. We need to verify how close the number of cases is to of actual fact. Um, if we were to restrict this bar graph regarding false negatives, true uh, negatives, and also the positive, if we apply to the coast, the model performs even better. And there's an area under the curve of 76% with an accuracy rate of 65% and false alarms, 26%. So most false negatives are located in the rainforest and the central coast. And we feel that the model can improve if we include 2023 data. We used the 2022 annual effect for this model. So if we had information about the 2023 cases, we can improve uh, the, the, the model's predictions. In brief, this model has been useful, and it's very good at predicti predicting dengue outbreak risk at province level. And this can be done for a uh, uh, one to six months period. In order to improve model predictions, we need to update the model periodically with new data in order to improve interannual effects. And as someone said, to do this, it's important to collaborate with the government institutions and ensure the model sustainability. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paloma. Uh, it's a pleasure of introducing Martin Lotto Batista, who is a researcher at the Global Health Resilience Group, who will share a slight change of uh, direction and share a case study of using this system to predict leptospirosis in Argentina and Brazil. Thank you, Martin. Muchas gracias, Rachel. Eh, bueno, como ha dicho Rachel, mi nombre es Martín Thank Loto you so Batista. much, Rachel. I am Martín Loto Batista. I am a member of the Rachel's group at the Na uh, National Support Computer Center. I I've been working with them for a, a bit over two years. And today I would like to talk about something different 
uh, not about dengue. I would like to talk about our modeling system for supporting decision making in leptospirosis breaks, in particular in two regions in the southern corner of uh, Latin America, south of Brazil and north uh, east of Argentina. In Argentina, we have and are working with the team of uh, Dr. Mueller at the uh, Literal National University and her team. It's been a pleasure to work with them, and I'm sure they're here and they can join the, the debate later on. Uh, some context, if, if you're not familiar with leptospirosis, it's an infection disease caused by uh, different bacteria excreted uh, by um, rodents, mainly rats. So they uh, remain in water courses, although most infections are asymptomatic, there might have be some fever, and some cases can become severe. Therefore, they uh, jeopardize the patient's life. But what's most important here is that as the disease keeps circulating uh, among rats, it is climate sensitive uh, um, and it is sensitive to, for instance, floodings, because when there is excess water, rats tend to shelter in human settlements, and this increases the risk of uh, coexisting with rats. So by using the climate instruments that we have mentioned already, we could look at the risk of exposure for people and help develop preventive measures to reduce the impact of the disease. In this case, in particular, we use records for the surveillance systems in Santa Fe and Entre Rios, two provinces in the northeast in Argentina, and these metropolitan areas in, in Brazil, metropolitan and wireless. In Argentina, we look at three departments that from 2009 to 2022 accounted for over 75% of the Lexus process cases and the database was wider. Paraná, Rios, and the capital of Rosario. So probably you have heard this a million times already, but based on well, what we explained already throughout our presentations, we're going to use a time model that is independent for all the different regions and mentioned before, using a combination of random uh, effects, interannual effect, and seasonal effect. After analyzing a selection of models with a great diversity of just uh, statistics, we found that the El Nino Oceanic Index might have a late three month effect in leptospirosis outbreaks combined with local climate processes that tend to be more immediate. Instead of three months, you can see it's one or two months except in Parana that <clears throat> temperatures one to three months and rainfall two to four. So therefore using these associations, we measure the capacity to predict outbreaks compared with a seasonal only model. And this is a reference model. This model is based on empirical knowledge that between month A and B season, in terms of the seasons we used to have, or we usually have the highest number of cases recorded at hospitals. This graph shows the balance between sensitivity in outbreak capture and specificity in its uh, capture. But what I want to show is that by comparing with the reference model, across all cases, we see an increase in the area under the curve that is saying that it has a better capacity to detect outbreaks in the future, around 22% in the capital, up to 45% in Rosario. And there is also a reduction in the number of false positives as high as compared to the reference model in Paraná up to 42% or low as in Valles at a 26%. So these forecasts will fit to the NCAN gas platform as you know show at the beginning and they can be reflected in bulletins as well we know that the public health uses reports to communicate across colleagues and with our superiors and in this example 
and I'm showing different examples in Argentina. I'm showing a bulletin that was generated for January this year and the risk probability for the different departments looking into the future, into the next six months. And for Brazil, <coughs> I'm showing the bulletin generated for July 2024. It's the most recent we have showing the monthly probabilities or the risk levels. Now, to end, I would like to stress why these tools are so relevant for similar processes in regions that are apparently different. In both regions, we found sensitivities similar to events that happened during El Nino phase. And it's also there's more and more immediate effect of climate events like temperature or rainfall. However, we also need to consider the differences between regions for example, we would assume that in the Atlantic it would have a feedback effect against the El Nino, which is a Pacific event in more coastal regions like Metropolitana and Valles. So there's still a lot of work to do. We want to implement this spatial resolution in our tools, include more regions that would make it possible to work with more time and space, more complex models to fine tune parameters and just parameters that increase the effectiveness in uh, forecast. At the same time, it would also allow us to adapt it to the specific needs of the different regions and national systems. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll be back for the Q&A. Uh, now I'm going to pass over to Chloe Fletcher, who's going to uh, cover some of the innovations and advanced methods that we're considering to uh, move forward with the platform. Thank you, Chloe. No problem. And so for this final case study, I will share an extended capability of the N-Class framework, which explores the compound effect of climatic extremes on dengue risk. And I'll be giving examples for analysis and real-world prediction models that have been developed for Barbados and Brazil. So over the last few years, we've been working with collaborators across the Caribbean region, including local and regional health agencies and meteorological services, and researchers to uh, develop bespoke climate integrated early warning systems for dengue in Barbados, Grenada and St. Lucia. And this follows on from previous work conducted by Loetal in 2018, which explored the effect of drought, extreme rainfall and temperature on dengue outbreaks in Barbados. In this work, the researchers found that the relative risk of dengue increased four to five months after drought events and zero to one month following exceptionally wet conditions, which are represented here in figure A on the left-hand side. Now, it's important to note that dryness and wetness is measured using the six-month standardized precipitation index, also known as the SPI. Uh, and in, it, in this study, the researchers used a distributed lag nonlinear model to infer these climate and disease risk relationships. However, they did not consider the interacting effects of climatic extremes on dengue risk, where the variables have a combined impact on disease. For example, the impact of temperature and drought may be linked and have its own separate effect on disease risk. Therefore, we've developed a dengue prediction model framework in Barbados, which accounts for interactions between three variables, including temperature, uh, long lag SPI, so SPI, uh, further along ago, around the four to six month ago mark, and short lag SPI around the one to two, uh, one to three month ago mark. And this model accounts for the individual effects of each variable on dengue risk, which we can see in the top row. So we account for the separate impacts of all those three variables, uh, as well as compound effects from every single combination of these three variables. So we can see every pair of variables on the second row. So we can look at how temperature and drought uh, interact with one another and temperature and short lag wet conditions and long lag drought and short lag wet conditions. As well, we're looking at the combined effect of all three variables on the bottom. And all of these effects are then added together to work out the overall effect of climate on disease risk, along with uh, additional random effects that we saw in the uh, NCAS models previously. 
Now, just to show how the SPI fits in with other data in Barbados, here is a time series plot, uh, which shows from top to bottom, the monthly dengue cases, the uh, Nino 3.4 index, the SPI variable at the six months SPI, and uh, the mean temperature on the bottom. Here we can see a very clear inverse relationship between the SPI and the Nino 3.4, indicating that El Nino events are highly associated uh, with drought events in Barbados and uh, La Nina likely associated with wet, uh, extreme wet conditions. So dengue cases appear to peak after a sharp increase from dry to wet conditions, which supports findings from these previous studies. So in our final model, we've recently done some analysis to determine an appropriate model to implement in the early warning system in Barbados. This incorporates a long lag SPI uh, by five months, a short lag SPI by one month, and a mid lag uh, temperature variable to predict uh, dengue outbreaks in Barbados. And this scheme shows if we were uh, using a prediction scenario, which data are required in order to generate our dengue uh, risk forecast three months in advance. So for example, if we're issuing in March, we're looking to forecast the cases in June. And we can see that due to the lagged associations, we can use a combination of observed climate data and seasonal forecasts in order to make these predictions. And in this uh, framework, we're using real-time case data uh, from the month prior to our forecast issue in order to make our prediction and increase its accuracy. So when we look at the compound effect of the climate variables on dengue risk under a range of different scenarios, so I'll just explain these plots in more detail. On the left-hand side, we're looking at what happens under cool conditions uh, for Barbados, and on the right-hand side for warm conditions for Barbados. On the x-axis, we have the long lag SPI, which moves from dry, which is minus around minus two, to wet conditions, uh, which is a plus two. And on the y-axis, we go from dry minus two at the short lag to wet conditions. Uh, and on the red on this plot would indicate there is an increased risk of dengue, whereas gray would indicate a reduced risk of dengue. So it's here it's evident that dengue risk is greatest following long lag dry and short lag wet conditions when it is hot in Barbados. So we can see that real intense color on the right hand side uh, representing that. And uh, lowest dengue risk is during cool and prolonged dry conditions, uh, where we can see on the left hand side marked by the more black and gray colors. As a result, we've developed this schematic to represent the information more clearly and show how this forecast scheme was applied recently during the T20 Men's Cricket World Cup, which took place across many parts of the Caribbean in June 2024, with nine games, including the final hosted in Barbados. Uh, we, uh, we delivered an outbreak risk level forecast, which was is issued as of March 2024, for forecasted dengue risk in June 2024, which was shared with the Barbados Ministry of Health and Wellness, uh, Wellness once verified, uh, who were able to act upon this forecast in preparation for the games. Through our collaboration, we're looking, uh, we're working closely with the Barbados Ministry of Health and Wellness, as well as national and regional meteorological agencies to identify what actions should be associated with each risk level for epidemic preparedness. We'll provide more information on the specific Cricket World Cup forecast in a later publication. Following this work, we also wanted to evaluate how well the interaction methodology would apply in a larger country after successful application in a small island setting. Uh, previous findings by Loetal in 2021 found an increased risk of dengue in Brazil following long lag dry and short lag wet conditions with different effects in urban and rural areas. So very similar interacting, uh, sorry, similar results that we saw previously for Barbados. Therefore, we decided to explore whether a similar interaction model for SPI and temperature could be used uh, to predict dengue risk at the health region level in Brazil. This work is still under development at the moment, but so far we're seeing similar results to the Barbados model and previous research, where there is an increased risk of dengue following a long lag dry, short lag wet and hot conditions across Brazil. As a result, we're collaborating with the Info Dengue and Moss Climate Project to contribute to a dengue risk forecasting for the Ministry of Health over the coming year. 
This work specifically seeks to predict weekly dengue cases from October 2024 to September 2025 at the state level. Uh, we'll be producing finer scale forecasts at the health region level and subsequently aggregating these uh, to state level. So more information on that hopefully in the coming months. And I just wanted to say a huge thank you, muchas gracias, obrigada, to listening to all of the showcase presentations. I'll now uh, pass back to Rachel to open the floor for any questions. Thank you so much, Chloe. So we have uh, just a few minutes uh, to address any uh, final questions or comments. Uh, thanks so much. I've been, due to the shortage of time, been trying to answer some of them in the chat. Uh, we have a couple which are still open. Um, so we have one here from Alvaro. Um, so we know that there is um, several El Nino and La Nina events. And these different events can have different large scale teleconnections and climatic input impacts such as seasonal precipitation and temperature anomalies and the occurrence of extremes such as floods, droughts, heat and cold waves. Do you think that seasonal forecasts of rainfall and temperature are the main climatic climate factors of the model and not, not so much the SST anomalies in Nina regions? Would it be useful to extend the analysis in the future to more climate variables and geographic factors and perform the PCA? Um, so, but thank you for your positive feedback there, Alvaro. Um, so I'll pass that question over to Chloe. Uh, yes, as I just presented, we're also looking at these other approaches, potentially considering more extreme climatic events, such as drought and heavy rainfall, um, and also interested in potentially incorporating other extreme events, perhaps in relation to recent uh, Atlantic hurricanes, such as what was seen with uh, Hurricane Beryl, and what impacts things like hurricanes could also have. So I think this framework at the moment, it still needs some development in order to be able to move more into uh, these other climatic indicators, but it's definitely a live space that would be of interest. In terms of uh, whether the effects, which effects are most relevant, what we're typically seeing across the case studies is temperatures, uh, for dengue at least, temperature is looking to be a more significant variable in the majority of places with El Nino as a second place and precipitation a little bit more uncertain and locally local context is needed. Um, but in terms of, um, for example, in Barbados, we've seen much more excess, uh, success from moving from this NCAS framework to this uh, long and short lag methodology that incorporates interactions. So we'd be excited to test this elsewhere as well. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Mauricio, did you want to comment? No, I was, I was going to say that it's it's a phenomenal question and it's a very interesting one because have, we have seen, at least in Colombia, where you have like this massive heterogeneity, uh, sort of like as, as you move like closer to the coast, like kind of like temperature start to like, or the significance of, of temperature, temperature start to deplete and the ENSO indicators start to like come as a very significant uh, indicator. So, just to summarize, uh, it seems that it's like not all the variation, all the variability that you have in the in the case, it could be uh, accounted by precipitation and, and rainfall, and you need like uh, the the ENSO indicators to complement to explain that that variation. At least that's the case in Colombia. Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, we have a question here from Diego Xavier from the uh, Brazilian Climate Health Observatory. Um, cases of leptospirosis are frequently associated with disasters, while predicting cases in other situations uh, tend to capture only baseline cases, which mainly occur among exposed workers. Therefore, it would be necessary to predict the occurrence of disasters to anticipate leptospirosis outbreaks. Um, and Diego is asking if the models are adjusted to predict the occurrence of disasters. So I'll pass that question over to Martin. Thanks, Rachel. And actually, I hope it's okay for the interpreters that I change. I, I switch to English now. Um, uh, uh, the first thing that I would like to say is that um, our previous research has actually found this link um, with uh, flooding events. Um, we first uh, published our paper in Odyssey in Argentina. Um, for leptospirosis, I encourage everyone to take a look at it, and um, it's our, our, our first impression of how it is linked to extreme events. 
we are actually now um, after this project, uh, we're actually thinking of starting or setting up a collaboration to study more in depth um, the effect of extreme events on um, leptospirosis outbreaks. So we are not sure we we might be able to forecast extreme events, but we might be able to forecast the uh, dynamics of climate that might lead to extreme events and how that translates into um, probability of an outbreak. So um, this is also an open invitation to um, everyone who has ideas um, to throw them and we can set something up. Thanks so much, Martin. Uh, we're looking forward to working with the Brazilian Climate Health Observatory on that topic. Um, Mercy? Uh, sí, gracias, Rachel. Uh, um, y me gustaría complementar justamente porque de la comunidad. I would de, like to de, add de desastres, in the disaster risk reduction community, there is a database, a long standing database that is available for the region. It's called Desinventar. Desinventar provides information on, on floods, quite accurate information, fine information, and we are proving in Ecuador that the information on floods can be quite well mapped to a level of high resolution in cities, in rural areas, in addition to point density. I think that that information that's already existed systematized, standardized information that gathers or aggregates a few years or quite many years can be used for these models and could be significant, especially when we look at extreme floods that might also, we might also be able to determine the frequency and period of return and it's something to explore in future models as well. Thank you so much, Mercy, for those insights. Uh, we're now at time. I want to take the opportunity to uh, thank the entire team for this incredible effort to bring together all our partners in the, to work towards improving uh, prediction for climate sense infectious diseases in the Latin American Caribbean region. Uh, we're incredibly grateful to the Wellcome Trust for the generous funding of our projects and also to the IAI for um, hosting this webinar. And thank you so much to the interpreters uh, we really appreciate helping us um, disseminate our work uh, more widely. Uh, so thank you so much. Please stay in touch. And we look forward to organizing the next showcase with more updates. Have a lovely rest of the day.